Well, how welcome here. Welcome here to our campus in Stafford. Welcome our Fredericksburg campus and to those watching online during this Labor Day weekend. Uh, I know uh, a lot has shifted and changed and how we started school a little earlier, but you know, you never know what Labor Day weekend's going to hold, and it is good to see you here in the house today. I know some of you did get away this weekend, and, and bless you as you return back for another week this next uh, few days. But today, uh, I believe God has, has got some good things to say to us today. Even though it's a hard word today, I'd go ahead and give you a head start. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. Today, we're going to look at a very challenging passage, but I think, I think we can handle it. Come on, we're going to labor. We're going to labor through it today on Labor Day weekend, all right? Now, I know this all is, is right with the world right now because I heard pumpkin spice lattes are back, right? Come on, all is right. All is right with the world because football has returned. It's fall. It's fall. And for some strange reason, I just feel drawn to cheer for Penn State and for the Carolina Panthers. And maybe it's just from loyalty here, but there's just some players worth following. Listen, I don't know who you follow. I don't know who you follow, but there's something about fall. There's something about football that kind of go together. If you are looking around your row, people that you did not show up here with today, just speak across the aisle to them today. Come on and tell them who your allegiance, both camps, tell them who your allegiance is to on football. Come on, who's your team? Who's your team? Who's your team? Come on, tell them. Yes, yes, yes. I'm getting heckled here, Fredericksburg. This is that fun time in the NFL where everybody has a chance at the Super Bowl for a few more weeks, right? Right, Washington Redskin fans, right? A few more weeks. You're still, you're still a chance. You're saying I got a chance, right? No, it is good to be with you today. And as we lean in, we're in a series called Don't Miss Your Moment. And what I love about the moment here today is, is that there's a moment that's happened in Scripture called Pentecost. And it's a moment in the church's history that I hope we'll never recover from. That we'll always be in the moment of Pentecost. That we'll realize the power that fell upon the church then is the same power that we have access to now. That coming of the Holy Spirit. And so as we have been looking at the book of Acts, the story of the church, the story of the Holy Spirit, I, I pray that God's got some words for us today. Now what happened in Acts chapter 2 when Pentecost fell, there were about 120 believers. But in these 120 believers, on that day, 3,000 people began a relationship with Jesus. Is that not strong? I don't know about you, but I think about that day and I begin to imagine what was that day like when that many people awakened and said, Jesus is the answer. I declare him as Lord over my life. And then they went, then they went public and got baptized that day. 3,000 people got baptized. I hope they had enough towels that day, right? I mean, what amazing moment. I don't know about you, I'd love to have been there that day. I mean, how would I have been a part of that moment? But then the realist side of me starts to think about this. I wonder how many days into the future, now that there went from a church of 120 to now 3,120, I wonder how many days before complaining started. <laughs> come on, come on. It's like, oh man, I'm showing up for worship. There's no parking here. Where am I going to put my donkey and my camel, right? I mean, I'm thinking, oh, they better have enough kid volunteers. There's a lot of kids. The nursery's packed, right? Who's going to rock my baby when I go into church, right? I'm thinking, how long, how long did it take for that 120 go? I don't like all these people. The church has gotten too big, way too big. I don't like it anymore, right? I just wonder, because guess what? That's our, that's our nature, right? How interesting it is that in one moment, it's a blessing. And the blessing becomes a challenge like overnight, Right? It's like God gave us this amazing blessing of growth and now we've got a growth challenge. We've got to figure it out. And yet, isn't that true for your moments and my moments too? That what started as an answered prayer now all of a sudden is a teenager. You know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden we forget that there's work. There's work, there's work, there's work with growth, right? 
And so in this idea of, of growing here and leaning in here, don't miss the moment because it had to be a powerful moment. But I wonder how long they sat in that setting and went, man, how long is Peter going to keep preaching? Come on, it's time. We got food in the crock pot. It's time to get home. And yet in this moment, these problems that are now, they're, they're challenging are opportunities for them to what? To grow, to grow more into this moment. Now, in this idea, I want to give you a little more context that, that kind of makes a little more sense. Matter of fact, I have you in Acts 5. Turn back to Acts 2 for a minute because here's the problem. You've got 3,000 people that said, we live far away, but we don't want to go. We want to stay here. We want to keep growing and learning here. So this is not just a church thing. This is now a living thing. Where are we going to live? Come on, where are we going to get a job? Where are we going to worship? Listen, when there's 120, we could worship in the upper room. Now it's 3,000. Where can you gather 3,000 people, right? So there's these challenges, these challenges. How are we going to live this out? Well, Acts 2 actually gives us what they were committed to, to growing. Look at this, Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, I kind of highlighted those words. I want you to see that because I think every church needs to ask the question, how are we in teaching how are we in community with fellowship with each other? How often do we break bread? Matter of fact, breaking bread is kind of that idea of communion. We're going to actually do that next Sunday. If you're deacons here, we're going to be doing that next Sunday because it's time for us to sell that, celebrate that breaking bread. And then how do we do with prayer? Do we gather? Do we pray together? Right? It said this, that everyone, look at this, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and they gave to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and then they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Come on. Isn't that a pretty good plan? But yeah, it's a plan that's interesting. But if there's one thing I want you to see of the church then that God still wants for us now, if there's one word to describe Acts Church, the Acts 2 Church, here it is. It's this word right here. It's the word united. Come on, both campuses, say that word with me. United. They were united. They were one. They were working together. Come on. And in this idea of unity, uh, I want you to see it because there's something powerful about how they were growing in this relationship, not just with God, but with each other as a church, as a large church now. Now, this idea of where are we going to gather for worship? Well, they picked a place called Solomon's Porch. Now, if I were to give you kind of the old kind of picture of what this would have been, it's kind of the outer courtyard of the temple. Now, this is a rendition of what the temple looked like when it was in existence, but we know this gets destroyed. This is actually a model of it. And on the outside of this wall would have been Solomon's porch. You kind of see a little stage right there. This is where Peter would get and all the thousands of people would gather and they would come for teaching and learning. Now, interesting is that now in modern day times, that temple's gone and now there's a golden dome. The Muslims have now occupied that space, the Golden Dome, and it's their place of worship, one of the largest mosques in the world. And now in this Solomon porch area is actually a Muslim graveyard. It's interesting, right? Now, prophecy says this, that, that we're over here at the Mount of Olives looking in, the Garden of Gethsemane, we're over here looking in. This is where Jesus, when he comes back, he is coming back, y'all know that, right? And this is the gate he's going to walk through. I want you to see this because this is a real place. I want you to see this is a real problem that the church is solving. We took a group last year in the spring and we actually sat in that area and took a picture. And so I want you to see this. Now, next spring, we're gonna take another trip. I don't know if you could afford it, if you got time and money to do it this year, but we're gonna actually go to Turkey and Greece and we're gonna follow the footsteps of Paul. If you're remotely interested, don't, don't, don't wait. Come find out. Get information at one of our guest services at either campus and just take a step to find out more information if you want to come with us. But here's what I want you to imagine with me. 
I want you to imagine gathering in that group of 3,000, coming together for church. And while you're there in church, come on, think about it. I wonder if there was moments the crowd laughed out loud when Peter, the pastor, shared about something stupid that he did based on insecurity versus on his life in Christ. I wonder if they could relate to that. I wonder as they proclaim this new life in Jesus, they, that they really at times were filled with joy and praise and song because their life's not about religion, it's really about a relationship and how freeing that was. I wonder if there was moments where they fell on their face right there and they prayed to God because they were convicted of something, some truth that was being preached. and They were confessional and they were repentant because they wanted to be right with God. All of these moments, can you imagine what worship would have been like in that group of 3,000 that God was adding to their number daily? New people were being born again and coming alive in faith. And then when the day is over, they now got to go find a place to lay their head down. Now, we believe only about 100 of those believers lived locally in Jerusalem. Everybody else lived a far way off. So guess what those 100 homes had to do? They had to figure out how do we each take about 20 people into our home? Can you imagine at night when they finally went back home? Can you imagine around the dinner table, them all sharing these parties, the conversation, the laughter, singing songs, and even doing communion in the homes? And then they would roll out their bedrolls and all do this slumber party thing, and they'd roll them back up again the next day and go back to the temple day after day after. Could you just picture this, this idea of community. I want you to kind of see this. And as I thought about that, I thought about, just think about some of the people that were in that crowd, that they were sitting around going, dude, look over there. There's Stephen. Oh man, he's a sold out guy. Oh, look over there. There's Barnabas, right? And then there's little John Mark. He's with his mother, Mary. And then look, there's Mary, Jesus's mother. James is here now. That's Jesus' brother. Hey, look, look over there. And then all of a sudden there's Alexander and Rufus with their parents. Listen, all of a sudden they're seeing kind of these people that we read about in Scripture. They're a part of this church of 3,000. We sometimes forget this. This is real people that had a real blessing that now had to solve some of these challenges. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a church for one another? Now, Flip over to chapter four. I know I told you to go to five, but I had to get some context here so we can make sure we don't miss what God's about to tell us in this moment today. Acts chapter four, verse 32 said this. All the believers were one in heart and in mind. No one claimed any possessions as their own, but they shared everything, everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify about this resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Come on, Jesus raised from the dead. That means you can raise up and live a new life in Christ. They kept preaching the resurrection of Lord Jesus. And look at this sentence. And God's grace, God's grace, 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 God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. They're preaching about God's amazing grace And it was so powerfully at work within them all, this grace, that there was no needy person among them because they just kept providing. From time to time, there were those who owned land and houses and they would sell them and they would bring the money from the sales and they would put it at the apostles' feet and they would distribute to anyone who had a need. Come on, this kind of love, this kind of generosity, this kind of personal sacrifice was normal in the early church. Is that not crazy to kind of imagine that? Now, up to this point, the writer of Acts is a guy named Luke. Up to this point, we might say he's describing what the perfect church looks like. But if you have ever been to church longer than a day, you know that there's no such thing as a perfect church. Matter of fact, if there is a perfect church, it will become imperfect once you and I show up. (laughs) You know this, right? And even though he's sharing the highlight reel, this church is united because that was what God's heart is. God's heart is always for a church to be united. And if God's heart is for a church to be united, the enemy's heart is for the church to be what? Divided. Now, I said this last week because we're talking about this idea of moments. When you find yourself in a good moment and it begins to accelerate, 
As soon as you find yourself in a good moment, guess what's coming next? Conflict. Now, the first conflict that came against the church came from the outside. The outside attack was the religious world that did not like the movement of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, they arrested Peter, they arrested John, and they interrogated him and tried to, what, intimidate them? Shut your mouth. Stop talking about Jesus. And Peter said, we can't help it. Do whatever you got to do to us, but we can't help but talk about the name, the name above all names. The attack came from the outside. Now, you know this, once that doesn't work and the enemy can't get you from the outside, he goes Trojan horse on you, doesn't he? <laughs> Come on, what does that mean? He attacks you from the inside. Y'all know this. Now, now, let's just think about this for a second. Come on, all you guys out there that own your own business, you have your own business, you have your own company, or maybe you're on a team and you're leading a group of people. Uh, maybe you go to school and you're on a team, you play sports or you're on a team right now. Listen, you know this, a, a good attack from the outside, as hard as that is, it could actually be a good thing. When you get attacked by an opponent, guess what that has the, the opportunity to do? To what? To line you up, to be what? To be united. Come on, Friday night, we can be a team. We gotta work together as a team, right? But when the attack from the outside doesn't work, guess what comes next? It's what? It's the, it's the division within. I wonder which is worse. Come on, you know it, right? Which is worse, an attack from the outside or a division within? It's the within, right? That's where it gets tricky. Well, guess what? That's where we're going to find ourselves here in a moment in Acts chapter 5. Matter of fact, as we lean in on this idea of kingdom fallen, even Jesus said this, and Luke recorded it in Luke chapter 11, verse 17. He says, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. A house divided against itself will fall. And what is true for a family is true for a church. Are we going to be a united people? Come on. Are you ready for the word of God today? Uh, listen to me. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, was that just the introduction? <laughs> yes, it was. It's Labor Day. Come on, I got an extra day to work with here. <laughs> it's hard work where we're about to go today, and I want you to be ready for this. Listen, I think about the unbeliever that's here among us today. And I love that you're here. You're here because we invite, we want you to come be a part of this conversation. We want this grace, this God's grace to open your eyes and open your heart and help you to see. But I'm gonna be honest with you today, today's a hard word even for the church. My, this might be a harder word for the church to hear today. We're gonna start in chapter four still. And we're gonna look at one of the examples that Luke wants us to see something good that's happening in the church. Look at verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles gave a nickname to, they called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now, I, I, I did this last week talking about nicknames. There's something about getting a new name. And the Bible does this a lot. When you have these encounters that gives you a new name, there's something about a name. Last week, we kind of had some fun, right? Simon, Simon, hello, my name is Simon. He gets a nickname, cool name. Come on, they call him Peter, which means rock, which means rocky. Come on, yo, Adrian, I love it. Nickname, come on, I, maybe I love it because I, I got Todd Gaston, that's my name. Gaston, come on, ton of gas. That was the nickname, right? Listen, it don't get any better, but Rocky, could I get that name? And then Joseph, the Levite, they give him a name. They give him the name Barney, right? You're gonna be called Barnabas, the son of encouragement. I wonder this for your life today. Anybody got a Barnabas in their life? Anybody got somebody that encourages you, that builds you, that helps you see what you can't see? Come on, I hope you have a Barnabas. Let me flip it this way. Are you a Barnabas for somebody? Hey, Christians, you ought to be a Barnabas for somebody in their life. We need encouragement. We need sons and daughters of encouragement. Are y'all with me today? This is what he was. Now, it gives him this name Levite. This is interesting because if he's a Levite, that means he's part of the Levitical tribe, which means he wouldn't have owned land, at least in Israel but they said he was living in Cyprus. So he sold his little beach house in Cyprus, right? And he comes to the to apostles and says, here it is, let's take care of one another. 
I mean, this is radical, right? Can we agree? What an example. What an example. Well, then we get the next example. Look at this. Verse 1, chapter 5. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, they also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. But he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter, come on, the leader, the pastor, he says to him, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, they wrapped up his body and they carried him out and they buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what happened and Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord. Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they're gonna carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and she died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events come on are you scared yet do we need to take up another offering <laughs> listen I'm, I'm reading the word of God this week studying for this message and I'm going Pastor Andrew can you preach this Sunday this is a tough word two families sell property and give. One is praised and one family is destroyed. What in the world is going on here? What's the difference in their giving? And it's like this sometimes. Sometimes sin is so subtle. I read a lot of pre-verses because if I didn't read the context, if we read this passage like this, we read it out of context, we might miss the application that God really has in this story for all of us. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's a hard word. I give you that, but don't miss it. Listen, when we look here, Peter makes it painfully clear that giving is not mandatory. He says giving is always voluntary. Come on. This is not communism. This is not socialism. No. This giving is free will. He says that. Barnabas, you're the one that owned the land. You're the one that chose to sell your land and to give all, right? Peter even pointed out to Ananias, Ananias, you own the land. And afterwards, you owed the money that was yours after that. You had freedom to do whatever you wanted to do with that money and with that land. Whatever he chooses to give is a choice. Now listen, I do believe giving is a part of our lives as believers, I think giving has to do more with us and God than anything else. And I believe if you're a faithful follower of Jesus, then you're going to be a part of a local church. If you're a part of a local church, then you are going to give in a regular way, in a consistent way, in a percentage way. I think there's something about that kind of discipleship that is healthy and right for us as believers. Listen, I'm all about that. I don't shy away from that when the scriptures lead us there. But can I tell you today, this passage right here today, it's it's not about giving. This passage right here today is not about money. It it might seem that way on the outside, but it's not. This 
passage today, this word today has everything to do with motive. Why are you doing what you're doing? And one sold and gave in a generous way and showed his motive. And one couple kind of postured themselves, kind of held back a little, and they gave with a totally different motive. Motive, motive is what this passage of scripture is all about. I want you to see this. I want you to see how they were led. Listen to me. Ananias and Sapphira were jealous. We, we see this in a subtlety behind the scenes. They were jealous of Barnabas. They see Barnabas get all this praise. They see everybody revered Barnabas and they saw that and they wanted to be like him. And so they began to pretend that they were just as sacrificial as Barnabas. They began to pretend. Can I tell you this? Selfishness leads to a lie and leads them to lie about what they're actually giving. And here's the thing, they're more concerned with their image that they're willing to sacrifice their character. That's the sermon right there, you ought to write that down. They're more concerned with their image that they're willing to sacrifice their character. And as we lean in on this, they're willing to pretend a lie the Bible calls that a hypocrite. Y'all know what the definition of a hypocrite? It actually comes from early Greek theater. It's an acting phrase. It's an acting term. Y'all know this, right? It's a Greek word for actor. It's one who dons a mask to portray a character, to pretend to be someone Else. Do you know that Jesus uses this word hypocrite in another place in scripture? And it's when he's being challenged about money, he uses that word. And yet this is the word. If we were to define Ananias and Sapphira, they were what? They were pretending. They were pretending. They were pretending. Can I tell you this? Pride and selfishness will always cause you to miss your moment. It will always rob you of your moment. And you know what else it'll do? It'll begin to create division in your life. I want you to see this today on this weekend because there's something here for us. You know, listen, look at the verse three again. Come on, verse five, three, Acts five, three. It says, Peter said to Ananias, I want you to see the language. Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Look at that word, heart. That's a key part there that you have lied, and who did you lie to? Come on, this whole book is about the power that God wants to pour out on his church. This whole book is about the power of the Holy Spirit. And now you get this couple that's lying to the Holy Spirit. Why would you wanna lie to the one who can help you the most? You're lying, and you have kept some for yourself and this money that you have received. Listen, they have been living. I know sometimes we read the Bible from one chapter to the next and we think it's like no gap. Listen, there's been about four years of gap of them doing this life, meeting and worshiping, living in each other's homes. They've been doing this for about four years. And in that four years, Ananias and Sapphira have been receiving this help from other families and other people. Even though they have means here, they've been holding on to their means and receiving from others, right? And now it's their chance for them to give and they're only gonna give part, but they're gonna act like they've given all. Listen, there's something happening here that I don't want you to miss here. But he says something. He says that Satan has filled your Heart. Now, we're talking about names here. Come on, we can talk about Rocky. We can talk about Barnabas. But let's look at the name of Satan. It comes from the word asatan in the Hebrew. It's the satanus in the Greek. Listen, this idea of an adversary. Somebody against us. Somebody that's an enemy. And his most defined name is he's an accuser. An accuser. Satan has filled your heart, Ananias. Now listen, it would be easy for him to say, the devil made me do it, right? But Peter doesn't remove the responsibility that Ananias had in this moment of what he could do. As we look at this idea of pride, pride taking over the heart, it would eventually hurt the church if the pastor Peter looked this over. If he looked past this, it could eventually divide the house. Pride is a dangerous sin. Do y'all agree with that yet? 
Do y'all know how dangerous pride is? Pride, we could go all the way back to Genesis chapter three, and that's the first time sin shows up in the Bible with Adam and Eve. And did you know pride was the original sin? Hey, I think we can be like God. We would rather do this our way over God's way. If you keep reading the Old Testament, you'll hear about the angel of light, the most beautiful angel. His name was Lucifer, right? His whole job is to bring the glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. And he says, wait a minute, this glory, I want this glory. Pride caused the angel Lucifer to fall. Come on, Lucifer, Satan, aren't they the same? As we see this connection, listen, pride will destroy a person and it can destroy a family and it can destroy a church. Come on, I wonder how on time this word is for somebody watching here at Stafford. I wonder somebody down at Fredericksburg. I wonder somebody right now watching online how on time this word is because right now there's division right now in your camp. There's division right now in your unit, in your division, at your work. Come on, there's division right now on your team. There's division right now in your relationships. There's division right now in your marriage. Come on, who is God trying to speak to right now and that division is centered on pride listen we're going to labor through some things this morning don't miss this moment that God wants to have with us today in his word today listen as we look here at pride today I want you to be a note taker if you're not you need to write down three questions today because this enemy likes to work on our heart, I thought here's what we need to do. We need to question our heart. We need to question our heart and see if pride has made its way in us and it's, we're the ones creating division in the world that we're living in. And as we ask ourselves these three questions, I think these questions can transfer to any environment, any arena that we're living life in. These are good evaluation questions today that God wanted to ask Ananias Sapphira that God's now asking us today if we're willing to go there. Question number one, come on, question your heart. Question number one, how much time do you spend complaining about a situation or a person? The first question to your heart is complaining. Complaining, complaining. Can we just agree? Complaining is contagious. If you get hurt in your life, if you get frustrated in your life, if somebody's done something to you in your life and you use your energy to gripe about it, to talk about it, and to complain about it with somebody that has no authority to do anything about it, that's a waste of useless energy. And the more you complain, doesn't bring relief, doesn't bring resolution. If anything, it probably makes you more fired up the more you talk about it. You get more angry, more amped every time you talk. Come on, am I the only one up here today? Complaining, man. Now you might think, well, complaining, what are you talking about? Complaining, how did you jump there from pride? Listen, listen, complaining, listen, it's easy to see it when you begin to see how negative you can get in your life, listen, come on, go with you next week to work or even last week to work. Something happened at work that made you mad, set you off, lit the fuse, hit the trigger, right? And you were mad and you were like, oh, and you left work mad. You got in your car and before you know it, you're mad at every driver on the road because it's their fault too. As you're changing lanes, you're mad at everything. Because what happens when you complain about one area of your life, all of a sudden you become a victim in every area of your life. By the time you got home, you were mad at everybody that lived at your house, including the animal, the pet of your family, right? Dog lovers, cat lovers, you were mad, right? Because somehow it's their fault too, right? And what happens is, listen, we don't like to see it, but there's a connection between pride and complaining because you know what complaining means complaining means life would be a whole lot better if people would do things my way yeah your way's best come on you know right your way's true in your humble but accurate opinion right y'all know this if people would just do it my way the world would be better that's complaining That's complaining, and I'm telling you, this young church acts as off to a good start, but nothing will slow it down. Nothing will divide the house like some good old-fashioned complaining. I know complaining never happens in church (laughs) from Sunday to Sunday. Come on, we're imperfect people. We got enough room to offend each other every time we gather. 
And I guarantee you, Sunday lunch, there's a lot of complaining about the sermon, about the music, about the parking, about why well, I'm not going to, I'm going to watch online next week. I might not even go back next week, right? Listen, it is easy, easy to fall into these patterns because if you're frustrated with one person, you'll begin to get frustrated with every person. And too often we feed it. Why? Because Satan begins to fill our hearts. The Bible advises us, if we're frustrated with a person, then go to the person. And if you need it, get trusted accountability to go so you can keep your heart right in the conversation. But the more you complain, it grows, doesn't it? It grows. I thought about this. I wake up on Saturdays. My rhythm is this. I usually wake up and I read through my notes to try to get that sermon in my head and my heart a little bit. And then I usually go out for a run or do something. And then, and then the Saturday we do a lot of different things. And yesterday my things were, were alone because my family went away uh, for Labor Day weekend. And, and I had some things to stay back for uh, called church. And because I work on Sundays, I said, no, babe, I can't go. And they decided to go uh, out of town. And for me, uh, last weekend, I had the blessing of spending about five to six hours power washing my deck, which I hated every minute of it. And so this weekend, I said, I'm going to tackle it. I'm going to stain the deck. Ah, oh, the blessed staining the deck. And as I'm staining the deck, I, I reminded myself where my family was. Now, my daughter, Hannah, she's a school teacher, and she went away this weekend to go see uh, her boyfriend. Her boyfriend graduated from Liberty. He commissioned in the Army. He's down at Fort Rucker learning how to fly helicopters. And she went down there to visit his friends and him and spend the weekend there. And, and the rest of my crew, they went to Florida. Now, I know we all watch the news and hurricanes coming and everybody's evacuating Florida. Not my family. Not my family, no, no, no. Our Sydney is down in Florida at Disney World and we gotta go see Sydney on Labor Day weekend. And so when everybody's getting out, my family's going in the eye of the storm. Now, praise God for timeshare and annual passes. That's all I'm saying. But as I'm staying in the deck, I'm going, that's great for my family to get to go do some want to's while dad's back here having to do the have to's. Are you with me? How many of you have those conversations? Come on. You know, you know, when you're working eight hours later, you're like, I just done the spindles. That's all I've done. Right. And you're like, this is like, oh, my family's a Disney world. And I know why my, I know why my wife went because that's where her favorite is. And I, I know you're not supposed to say that when you've got four kids, but we know clearly who my wife's favorite is. <laughs> it's Mickey Mouse. <laughs> clearly. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, the more I'm paying, the matter. You, you know what? I'm, and I'm thinking, here I am preparing for a sermon on complaining. And I'm going, you know how easy it is for Satan to, to fill your heart? It, it, it don't, listen, listen, listen. It'd be one thing if when I was done with the deck, if I learned how to do karate when it was over. You know? You know, come on, come on. Wax on, wax on. Pay on. If, but I don't know any karate after doing my deck. All I know is I'm sitting down preaching today because my back hurts. I might need a little Mr. Miyagi today, if you know what I mean. Listen, listen, you can take the guy out of the 80s, but you can't take the 80s out of the guy. Are you with me? As I'm thinking about complaining, I want us to lean in because there's number twos right behind it. Look at this, look at this, look at this. When is comparison, when is comparison growing in your life leading you to frustration and resentment? So you got complaining and now you've got comparison. You, you with me yet? You see, as we start to kind of slide in here and see what's happening in this heart of Ananias and Sapphira, we begin to see something here in this idea of comparison, comparison. You see, is, is that not the world we live in today? I mean, it used to be when I was growing up, oh yeah, you gotta keep up with the Joneses. And all that meant was like a few people that lived around you, right? 
Come on, I can be better than a few people around me. Now the Joneses is everybody else in the world, right? Because social media is a constant world of comparison. Do you know how filled our lives are with comparing our lives to one another all the time, all the time, all the time? And this idea of comparing I think about even social media. How many followers do I get, right? How many likes do I get? And it's like I'm seeking approval for everybody else to affirm that my life is okay. This world of comparison is exhausting. And you'll never measure up. You'll never measure up. But yet, that's what we, that's what we get. Listen, listen, when we look here at this, you got to understand this is the real world. i got to give some application here. Matter of fact, Tim Elmore is a writer that does a lot of research how to disciple this next generation. And he says, man, parents, we better pay attention to this next generation. Here's what he says about social media. He says, every hour of screen time results in becoming more vulnerable to what? Anxiety. Do y'all know that this is the... This generation is the most anxious generation we've ever seen. Psychologists, counselors will say, this shocker. I mean, we should not be confused why. The screen time is leading to depressive episodes, loneliness, sadness, and hopelessness. What's the cure? We gotta cut out some of the screen time. We gotta cut out some of the scrolling. We gotta cut out some of the comparison because it's killing us. We'll never measure up to somebody's highlight reel all the time. Come on. Stop comparing your vacations and what you ate for dinner. Come on, we can't, we can't live up. And I'm not saying it's all evil and bad, but you better check yourself, check your heart, and ask, is this comparing Growing resentment in my heart, in my life. Listen, listen, Ananias and Sapphira, they watched how everybody got all excited at the gift that Barnabas brought. And privately, they watched and they wondered, well, I wonder if they're going to get excited about us in the same way. And they began to kind of look at that moment. Come on, why, why can't we get that position? Why can't we get that kind of attention? We've been here a long time too. We've given a little bit. Don't people know what we give? I might be just hold back my gift to see if they miss it. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I like what they do with that money anyway. We don't need another campus in Fredericksburg. Come on. I mean, all of a sudden, guess what happens? This idea of comparison, and it gets tricky, right? And, and maybe all of a sudden, I think I can do things in a better way, and so I will just pretend. But see, pretending, as I said a moment ago, is the motive, and pretending is exhausting. Because see, pretending is focused on the outside while you're ignoring the the inside how many of us are trying to keep up a certain image and we know it's not true right it's the difference between what do you focus on your character or your reputation I love what the great late John Wooden said famous coach he said this he says be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is who you are and your reputation is merely what others think you are some of you are wearing yourself out, trying to keep up an image, trying to hold up a reputation, and you're dying inside. Listen, can I tell you this? Worry about your character and you get reputation thrown in. That's how that works. But too often the enemy, he deceives us and he lies to us, he accuses us, and we begin to buy into the lie. Ananias and Sapphira begin to buy into the lie. Listen, you need to invite God in. Character grows from the inside out. Y'all know this to be true, right? Number three on the list. What truth, what value, what moral boundary are you willing to compromise? So what do we have here? Complaining, what was number two? Comparison. Now number three is compromise. I want you to see this. Satan usually tempts us with small things, 
before he leads us to big things. It progresses. He knows he would shock us if he said, you're gonna, you're gonna do this. But what he does, he gets you to back all the way up back here where you make a small decision that seems no big deal, a small compromise, no big deal. And you do it back here. And if you do that long enough, guess what it does? It always, what? It grows into something more. It always leads you further than you ever intended to go and staying longer than you ever intended on staying. And it gets you, right? I wonder right now, these small decisions that you're making in your life, is there a gap right now between your public life and your private life? The enemy loves to work in the gap. Loves it. I wonder right now, is there anything in your life that you're hiding? See, too often... It's the things that we're trying to shelter. I wonder this, how many times do you have to to delete an email or hide an email or hide a, a text? Or you have to rename a certain person number in your phone and you're having to hide maybe a voicemail message or delete it before it's heard or overheard. Listen to me. Listen, I don't know if it's your phone. I don't know if it's your computer. But is there any area of your life that you're inviting what? Compromise into. Come on, I told you we're going to labor today. This is Labor Day, right? Let's look at this. Let's listen to this. Peter says it best. You didn't just lie to people. He said you lied to the Holy Spirit. And what's even worse, in essence, you don't even see, is that you're lying ultimately to yourself. Compromise. Compromise is such a slippery slope to begin I love it when uh, John talks about the enemy. John 8, he says it this way, so clear. He says, you belong to your father, the devil. That's another name for Satan. It's another name for Lucifer, right? He says, you belong to your father, the devil. When he, when he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. I believe Satan's greatest trap for Christians is to get us so obsessed with an idea or wants to get us so focused on a a course of action that we get blinded to the potential consequences of that decision. How many times do we get deceived into compromising. Listen, where are the areas right now you're compromising in? Maybe it is in the area of money. Maybe it is in the area of image. Maybe it is in the area of an inappropriate relationship. Maybe it is in the area of pornography, or maybe it is in the area of unforgiveness. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is, but if God's showing you, don't be deceived any longer. Stop pretending. It's time for you to do something about with what you're hearing. It's time for you to stop lying to yourself. What a challenging message today. Amen. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back out. And I know as I even preach this message last hour and what God's saying right now in this hour. I don't know how personal the Holy Spirit's being right now in this hour, but the hardest part of this whole passage for me is, as a teacher and coming today, knowing I'm gonna speak to people that are Christians and what they need to maybe experience today and God's truthfulness in his word. And then I thought about the unbeliever today listening to this message. And I don't wanna soften it for either, either person listening. I don't want to soften. I don't want to take it back. I want it to be the fullness of the truthfulness of God's word. But you know the hard part of this? Is this story is also about God's judgment. Our God's a holy God. And in this story, this couple's motive is exposed. And they both lost their life in that moment. There's immediate judgment in that moment. And this immediate judgment, this sure sounds more like the Old Testament than the New Testament. Can we at least go there? I'm like, God, why are you so immediate in this moment? And yet in a lot of other moments, you seem a lot more gradual in your judgment. And I started asking the question, which is more loving, for God to be immediate or for God to be gradual? Because the truth is, is God is always going to be eventual. Look at these words. 
Our God's a holy God. Our God is very serious about sin. And is it because this church is so new that he says you gotta be equally serious about sin because if the sin of pride gets up in this house, the whole house will divide and fall. I don't know why that this story is so immediate, but I know this, our God is a God that's holy and just. And one day all of us, all of us, all of us will face him. So maybe the love message that I preach week after week after week hasn't reached you. Maybe the the judgment (laughs) message could open your heart to say, I don't wanna be on the other side of that. I wanna be right with the Lord. So today, as I wrestle with this story, I started asking the question, you know, God, as I look here at this story, I think about this powerful part of the story that it was your grace. It was God's grace at work. It was God's grace at work in the person. It was God's grace at work in the church. And that grace that was at work, it's that pride crept in and began to hinder that work in the life and the heart of Ananias and Sapphira. Pride always gets in the way of grace. Come on, y'all know this, right? Got in the way. And yet God so loved them that he sent Peter to them to talk to them. And I looked at this moment and thought, what else could have happened? Could there been another way for this to have a different outcome? And I thought about this because we talk about names, names having meaning. Can I just tell you some irony in the story? Do you know what the name Ananias actually means? God is gracious. Is that not strong? Sapphira means beautiful. This could have gone a whole different way if they confessed, if they repented. Oh, what could have, what could have been different? But instead, they lied. And God gave them immediate judgment in that moment, in that lie. Come on, church, listen to me. Last week, I asked the question, what do you do? What do you do when the moment is changing you? You know what I thought about the question this week should be? What do you do when the sermon is for you? Because that's the hard thing about God's truth. God shows up sometimes in a quiet time and God says, hey, this is about you. Sometimes you're in a Bible study and they'll talk about a sin and you're like, ooh, that hurts. Sometimes you're in a sermon and you're gonna hear us talk truth and it's gonna go, whoa, that hurts. And what's gonna be your posture? What's gonna be your response? You gonna, you gonna get defensive? Are you gonna make an excuse? Are you gonna justify? Or are you gonna be soft and say, wow, I gotta deal with some things here. Listen, I realize we live in a world that doesn't match up with scripture. And I know the Bible, what it calls sin and stays constant in, culture changes its mind all the time on sin. Matter of fact, I feel for our younger generation that has grown up in a day where there's so much in your world that's called normal that the Bible says that's not. That's harmful. That leads to hurt. That leads to bondage. That leads to addiction. That leads to separation. That leads to death. Come on. I know we don't want to call certain sins sin anymore because it's a person that I know. I know that's the way it shifts. That's what the enemy loves to do. But I'm here to tell you, he's the father of lies. Let's trust the truth of God. And if it's convicting today and something that we got to deal with, let's deal with it. Let's not be like Ananias. Let's be soft and say, God, I don't get it. I don't like it. But God, I know you love me and I'm for you and I need to get right with you. Let's stop pretending. Come on. I know I'm over time. I know we're losing time to sing. But here's what I know today. Some of you today, you've been pretending. You've been pretending. You've been faking it. And you are so far. And God says, it's time to lay that down today. And you got a chance. You got a choice but you gotta surrender it up. And so I thought the best way for us to end a message like this is to open up at both campuses. Come on, Pastor Andrew, both campuses, the altar. Because today God wants to meet us right here today. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, I can't think of a better moment for you than for you to step away from pride, thinking you had it all figured out, for you to stand up in humility, to walk an aisle and get on your knees and to begin a relationship with Jesus right here today at this altar. But you know what? This message is for believers today. God has called out sin. And there are 
original sin is pride. And I believe today if God has spoken to you about an area of your life, a sin in your life, a broken place in your life that you haven't surrendered, then you need to be just as humble to get up at either campus and to walk an aisle and get on your knees and lay it down today. Come on, don't let the enemy fill your heart any longer. Don't let him confuse and deceive any longer. Come on, God brings freedom. God brings life. Matter of fact, Paul says it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. I love a song. It says, it's in your kindness, Lord, that you lead us to repentance. Look at this verse. Godly sorrow, it leads somewhere. It might hurt us. It might hurt us. But godly sorrow leads to repentance that leads us to salvation and leaves us with no regret. But earthly sorrow, where does it lead? It leads to death. Come on, the choice is yours today. What do you do with what you've just heard this morning? Father God, I pray for both campuses right now in the name of Jesus. God, I don't know what's going on in each life. I don't know the hurt. I don't know the betrayal. I don't know what's caused unforgiveness. I just know this, God, if we hold any longer to that pride, it's killing us from the inside out. God, today in the name of Jesus, may your word be as clear and may today it do work in our hearts God for the person that needs to begin to the Christian that needs to lay it down God right now would you get them out of their seat right now would you get them to stand up to walk an aisle and to lay it down as we sing this final song may people at both campuses move in obedience to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit lead us right now God in Jesus name we pray amen